So we are continuing to explore IPv6 uh, feature. So we are going to see IPv6 protocol. So you know that in IPv4 we have a like, protocol ICMP that has been developed to carry error messages. When you send a frame on the network, a packet on the network, and you, you have a trouble, then a router can send you back an ICMP message. So in IPv6 we have the same uh, thing, but it has been reordered and it's more, much more clean than in uh, IPv4. So first, if you look at the packet message format, it's almost the same. We have type, but we give the generic vision, the generic meaning of the packet, and then code, which will give more information about this. And we have a checksum. And here the checksum is mandatory because since we don't have any checksum at layer 3, we push it at layer, at layer 3. So, if you look at values of the value for the type field, so you have value B below 128 that are used to define error message that happen when you send a packet. So, for example, you have value 1, destination reachable. It means that your packet never reach the, the, the final destination. Ever because some router didn't have a prefix, a root on the service prefix, or you don't find the appropriate protocol on the host, etc. Et so you have all the vision, we will see that after. Packet too big. So we have seen that it is used for, for fragmentation. Time exceeded, it means that you have sent a packet and your hot limit has reached one, has reached zero, sorry. So this is used, for example, with the Trustroot program. So you know Trustroot? No? Yes? Yes? Uh, and also for fragmentation, if you are, you are waiting, or five months to uh, much time. And when you are creating a packet which is not correct, for example, you have extension and you don't find the appropriate field in extension, extension then you have the parameters problem. So here you see we have only four error message and they are all with very small values. So they are at the same time. In IPv4, since new, mess new messages have been added, then you have done this, uh, this logic. And then you have some application that can use also ICMP to carry information. So the best example uh, of application is ping. So when you send a ping or ping sys, then you send an ICMP message with an echo request. And when you receive a reply, so another ICMP message, then you display a message. You have here, so far, value 130, 131, and 32. These values are used by a new protocol, which is called multicast listener discovery. So multicast listener discovery is what you have in IPv4, like IGMP, Internet Group Management Protocol. So for multicast group, now it has been pushed with ICMP. And the last part, we are going to spend much time, more time on uh, these messages because they are used for router, for neighbor discovery, for the neighbor discovery, neighbor discovery protocol. It means that we have a router solicitation. It's a message we will send in broadcast on the link to talk with routers. We have router advertisement, so it's the answer of the router that can carry parameters for auto configuration. And we have neighbor solicitation. It's a query we send on the link to talk with neighbors. Our network, the neighbor advertisement is the answer from the neighbor. So these messages, these two neighbor solicitation advertisements, are the equivalent of IRP in IPv4. So instead of using a specific protocol, now this protocol is directly included in IPv4. And we have a redirect message when you want to change the rules. 
For example, you have a link here, and you have a host that has its configuration, so it, uh, the local configuration. So here you have a network with a prefix alpha. So your routing table says that when you want to reach something on alpha, you can use Ethernet, and when you want to leave, then you have to send to alpha.1. So that's the minimal configuration of a router. Now suppose that we have this topology, where I have another router, alpha.2, and I have another prefix beta. So what will happen when I send the message to beta? So here I just follow my routing table. That says that I want I am alpha dot three. I want to join beta dot one. Beta dot one is not specified, so I send it to my default router. My default router has a beta knowledge. You know that alpha can be joined by Ethernet, and beta can be joined by sending to alpha dot two. So here, my packet is sent again. It's sent again on the link to this router, and then to the destination. So it's not optimal, because here, your packet goes twice on the network, on the link. So some administrator doesn't care about that. To be sure, the switch is not so obvious. Um, but we can try to optimize things. And you can do the optimization by sending to the source a redirect message And say that if you want to join beta.2, then send it to alpha.2. So next time I will send a packet to that destination, I will, of course I will put that in my routing table, for beta.2, it's alpha.2. And next time I will send a packet, I will send directly to this router. And I will optimize the So same behavior in IPv6. So in this example, you use change a point by column column and you have an example that works with uh, So yeah, there is no big difference. So protocol. One important protocol is fast path and TV discovery. So there is one reason why we need a lot of path and TV discovery at concurrently is because we IPv6 network is not totally uh, full connect. You don't have a full connectivity in IPv6. So sometimes, to connect some part of the network, you will you will be obliged to use a tunnel. So yesterday we we have seen some kind of tunnels. It means that you take an IPv4 packet and you put this IPv4 packet. You put IPv6 on this. So it means that if I have an MTU, MTU of 1,500, at the IPv6 level, I have only 1,480 bytes. So if I have a network where I am in, we're using Ethernet without any problem, and then I reach a place where I have a tunnel, so if I'm sending a packet with an MTU of 1500, then this router will not be able to carry the message on the tunnel because packet is too big. So I will receive an ICMP message, packet too big. Okay? So that's, uh, that's what we are going to see here. Except that here, we don't put uh, 100 for 128, but here it's a minimal value that a link layer can carry. So if you build a new network protocol, and the network protocol is just able to carry, for example, frame of 100, uh, 1,100 and uh, 1,100, 
then you cannot put IPv6 on it. So that's the rule that has been defined by IPv6. All the link layer must be able to carry frame of 1,280. Which means that we can have a lot of tunneling. Because here, you see, we, we are losing about 300 bytes just for or 220 for tunnels. So that's a lot of things. So compared to Ethernet, and you have Ethernet almost everywhere, is not really a problem. We are going to see just after some place where we, we can have this problem. So here, I have my, my equipment here, but want to send a packet. So here, the default path MTU, path MTU, it means that it's uh, which value I can use on all the path is 1,500. So I send the packet, it arrives to this router, and this router send packet to me. So here, either I have this card, I've lost this datagram, for example, if I have in UDP, I will have lost this information. But for the next, I will maintain that for to to reach B, now the MTU is at value. So, of course, you may uh, joke, you may make some joke with computers, because you see that the equipment that can send MTU, path MTU is any host on Earth. Because here it's a router on the path. And I don't know the address of router on the path. So I can send to your laptop the path MTU, but say that if you want to reach Google, then the path MTU is 1,280. So I will reduce the performance of your device because you will send less information on each path. But I cannot go under this value 1,280 because it's a minimal value link has to support. So I cannot send, for example, for a packet too big, MTU equal 1. Because it's not legal, the smallest value is this one. And so it's not so far from Ethernet value, so of course you reduce a little bit the performances, but it's not really a big problem. So it's not a kind of problem. But you have another problem with this kind of thing, is that you have some network manager that block all the ICMP messages on a link. So here, for example, I have a server, a web server, and here I have a firewall, and my firewall will block ICMP message. So I will never know that uh, the value is too, too small. So what will happen? And it's a common bug you may find when you are working with uh, IPv6. So here you want to, to see a page on your web server. So you have a, a client here that open a TCP connection with the server. And here, no problem at all to open the TCP connection. Because you are sending small messages Sin, Sin hack, hack. So you can open the connection yourself. Then you can send your request, get slash, to get the content of your information of the, the cell. Of course, it's not just get, you can have cookies, you may have. Uh, uh, your browser characteristic, but it's still a small packet. And your browser, your uh, server, will answer. And here we we'll send you a HTML file. So this HTML file is very big. So here, it will arrive at this router, and this router will discard the packet. Because it's too big. And we'll send an ICMP message. But this ICMP message will be discarded by your firewall. So you will not know it. 
So, of course, TCP will time out and will resend again the friend or the packet. And the packet will be discarded by your router because it's too big. And you will have a strange behavior because if you do a telnet or SSH on the server, you will be able to work. If you work with it, if you do a ping, you will have an answer. And when you want to get a page, you will have an answer. So you have to, to remember, but in that case, maybe it's because you have some place where ICMP message are filtered, and so uh, they will not work. So one solution to solve this problem is if your network manager doesn't want to, uh, to allow you to get ICMP messages, so it's, for example, to reduce the MTV of the server, for example, to 1480, and this way we will not, we will, you will not have problems. Okay? So, but normally, a good network manager will allow you ICMP message. And that is the philosophy of IPv6. Because we, we have told you that we push all the computation, the complex field, on the edge of the network. And ICMP is a way to inform from problem in the core of the network. So you have to get this, uh, this kind of message. Uh, here, uh, I will skip that because it's not so important. We are going to, to see in more detail this, uh, this protocol, the port discovery, because it's a very important protocol. Something that is totally new on IPv6. You don't have this kind of feature in IPv4. So it allows you to have auto configuration in, in your network. So, as I said just before, you have functionality of uh, IRP, IPv4, that are included in uh, neighbor discovery. You have one new thing, it's auto configuration. And here we come back to the dream or to the functionality we had long time ago with APX, where you put your equipment on the link and your equipment is configured. So this is done by uh, Neighbor Discovery, and you will be able to create your IPv6 address, define your default router, and get from your router the MTU and copy bit parameters. It works only for host. It means that in the IPv6 network you still have to configure routers, but host doesn't have to, uh, to be configured. And there is a competition with a protocol DHCP because DHCP is, exists also in IPv6, but normally you are not obliged to use it in IPv6. So after that, it will depend on your uh, way you want to manage the network. Some network manager prefer to use DHCP, and maybe it will be useful on large companies when you want to keep, keep track of addresses, but in, but in home network, in, a, for example, on a TTAM, you want to connect to a Wi-Fi, then we don't have to use, we can uh, avoid the use of DHCP, and we can rely on auto configuration. You have also, but uh, this is a big debate, but we, we can talk about that after. There is another thing, so it's duplicate address detection. So in, in IPv4 we had something called gratitude serial IRP. So when you do a if config and an interface, you send an IRP message with your own address. And if you have an answer, then there is a problem because someone else on the network is using your address. So normally in IPv4, what do you do? You print a message on the screen of your laptop saying, oh, this uh, host is using or so but that's all. And you can continue to use your app. And maybe it will create problem. In IPv4, in IPv6, sorry, 
we will have uh, only uh, if we have a problem, if we detect that an address is used by another one, then you cannot enter the network. So it's uh, more strict than an individual. And then you have another thing that doesn't exist really in IPv4 is network unreachability de detection. And the idea is that when you have information, when you are doing an RP or LP like demo discovery, you have information in your cache. And then the system may verify from time to time if the information is still available. And for example, the best uh, behavior, the best usage of this is when you have a default route. So it's good to test if the default router is still active. Because if the default router has disappeared, you will not be able to send anymore information on the internet. Maybe you have another default router available on your link, but since you have select one, you cannot change to, to the other. In IPv6, if you detect that one router is dead, then you can switch to the other. And the other thing that is uh, new compared to IPv4 is that it works either in broadcast network like Ethernet, but also in NBMA So NBMA stands for Non-Broadcast Multiple Access. Have you heard of these networks? Have you ever used an NBMA network? Never. So, a good example of NBMA network is the telephone network. I think I've uh, used. So, when you have your telephone, you can call anybody on top. So that's multiple access. You can access everybody on top. But you don't have multicast. That's a shame, but there is not a number. You can get this number on all the telephones in Mexico will ring. It would be very funny, but it doesn't exist. So you cannot do as you do in Ethernet. In Ethernet, when you want to know something, you send a query on your link, all the equipment receive the information, and one who knows the answer can answer it. So this is with broadcast network. The NBMA network, you don't have this broadcast facility, so it's more complex to get information. Because you cannot send a query to all the equipment and ask, what is, what is the phone number of this person? Okay? So, it's, we have to manage a network differently. A network discovery can work on that kind of network. And that's a big difference with IRP protocol, because IRP just works on broadcast network. So, we are going to see uh, an example on how we can configure this laptop, through laptop. And here we have on the left, we have a router. First thing we have to do is to configure the router. So the router must have, of course, the router will have its microcore interface up, because this is automatic. And I can assign a prefix to that router. For example, prefix alpha. And I will also configure the router to answer to a network discovery protocol. So, now my node has a node that he wants to connect to be uh, active on my link, so I switch on the interface. So first thing to do when you switch on the interface is to create your link of products. So it's quite easy, either you take your MAC address, you put FFFE in the middle, and you add FEAT uh, on the left. In this way, you, you have your MAC address. Or in Windows, you draw a random number and you put FFFE on the left. on the left. So now, big question. I am, am I alone to have this address? I don't know. 
Maybe I have bought some uh, Chinese Ethernet card and they, are, they didn't pay their tax to IEEE and so they forged some black numbers. So in that case, I will now have two cards with the same black numbers. If I have two cards with the same black numbers, of course, I will have two new control address with the same value. And, and if I draw a number, if I am particularly unlucky, maybe another host has drawn this number before. But you see, the risk is very, very, very low. But it can happen. So, what do I do here? Is to send like a gratitude therapy. We had like before. But here it's a little bit more complex. So, first thing, the source address here on my IPv6 in my IPv6 either will be only zeros. Because I don't know if I can use my source address. I don't know if it's legal. So I don't put it in the header. And here I put, I send this to a multicast group. <coughs> and you remember yesterday we saw the algorithm to create solicited multicast group. So here I send to that multicast group. And I send a neighbor solicitation and I ask the question, who has this my address? And I wait for, let's say, one second. If during that one second delay I didn't get any answer, there is two possibilities. One is that nobody has my address, and the other one is that my, my query or the answer has been dropped by a switch. And I did not get it. So I did do it a second time. And here, if I don't get any answer, either I am particularly unlucky too because I have lost two packets, and it's not my day. But normally, here, after two attempts, two or three attempts, I am sure that, and if I get no answer, I am almost sure that nobody in the link has my link of address. So I can use it right now to, uh, to communicate with the router. So I send a router solicitation to the routers on my link. So I use the multicast multi address ff02 clone clone 2. And now I can use a source address by link product. This will never leave, uh, leave the link. But in fact, I put also the up limit equal to 255. So it means that if I don't receive something with 255, it means that I have crossed a router. So 255 means that I have never crossed a router. And so this way, I'm sure that these things come from the router. And the router answered me uh, with, so it's a point-to-point -point answer, and here I have a router advertisement, and the router advertisement contains the prefix that is used on the link, the fact that can, I can use it to create my own address, or I cannot use it, and I have to ask DHCPv6 to get my address. So it's never a discovery that we build up if you can autoconfigure your address or query DHCPv6. Then you will have MTU. So MTU here gives you which MTU you can use for, on your link. And here I put 100. 500, uh, 1,500, but for example, in the example of the web, I may have put here 100, uh, 1,480, because I know that I have a tunnel just after, and this way I avoid fragmentation uh, on my Then I put a limit value, default value of 64, and then I have a bit M, and the bit M tells me that I can use DHCPv6 not to get an address, but to get other parameters like the DNS server name or 
Dios y Él es Abraham. And now, hay dos prefix. So hay dos prefix alfa, and here, for example, DHCPv6 is set to zero. It means that I don't have to, to use it. So, now I can create my global address, but before, I have to verify that nobody in my link use this global address. So I send again the neighbor solicitation, and here I send it on the multicast group, so normally it's the same multicast group as the link for address, because interface ID 2 is the same. And here I ask the question, who has my global address? I wait for two or three seconds, and if I don't get any answer, I know that this address is unique on the link, and I can use it. So here I have my global address, and I will set this router as my default router to go on the internet. And at this point, I am able to talk with any IPv6 computer on Earth. The only little drawback is that I don't have any DNS server, so I have to manually uh, type, or I have to type the IPv6 address on my web browser. So for common people, it can be a nightmare, but now for you, it's quite easy, so you will not be afraid about, about that. So we will see after how we can get parameters, DNS parameters. So, here is what happens, for example, when you arrive at ETA, if we add IPv6 on that link, then we will have uh, IPv6 activity and you will be able to uh, configure your laptop this way. So, you arrive in the morning, you boot your laptop, so it takes, uh, if you have Windows, it will take you one or two minutes to start. If you have Mac, it will be uh, almost uh, immediate. And, <coughs> but it doesn't matter, five or six seconds to get address is not a problem. Now, I have my mobile phone, and I am doing mobile telephony, and I am moving from one network to another one. So for example, I am using mobile IP to allow uh, continuity of communication with my mobile phone. The problem is now, you see that it's, time is a very important factor, because I am in the area, I am moving to another area, and so here, I start obtaining an IPv6 address. So it takes me a few seconds to detect the network, the Wi-Fi network. This is layer 2, I don't care about that, but it takes some time. Then I have to authenticate myself on the Wi-Fi, Wi-Fi. But that layer 2 is not my problem. And then I have to configure my address and it takes six seconds. And then uh, maybe I will have to do a binding update to say that I have moved to the server in the name. So it means that here I am losing six seconds. And if I am walking fast, maybe I will uh, cut my voice server like me. So some people propose to limit to suppress this because the risk of collision is very low. It's a random number of 64 bits, so the chance to get that two equipment get this number is very, very low. And for address based on MAC address, if you are using regular MAC address, there is no risk of collision. So, what do we do here? Is that, for example, we start the binding update and in parallel we use the IPv6 address and we start a DAD. What we call, so DAD is duplicate address detection. And so we send our neighbor solicitation request. And if we got no answer, then we say that our address is okay. 
But we didn't block the other things because we can directly use the address. If we find a problem, and we stop the we stop uh, the process here, and we cut our interface because the address is used by someone. But this way, we don't lose time to detect if the address is unique or not. You have another usage, so in NBMA network. So we are going to see that on an example. So when we receive a RSS sensor network, it's something that can be used because we don't want to avoid a lot of multicast in this kind of network. But another case is, for example, we are in a, a 3G network. So in a 3G network, you never talk directly to your network. You talk to a relay, and the relay talks to your network. So here, at the beginning, I don't know that I am in the NBMA network, or the official name of NBMA network is Offlink. So Offlink means that I cannot talk directly with equipment that share the same prefix as me. So in that case, I send my, I use my microphone address, and I send to the multicast group of router a router solicitation. But here, the answer varies. Here, I have the prefix I can use, the fact that I may or may not use the HTTP 6 as a in that case, I will not use the HTTP 6 so I can do auto configuration. But here, I have another parameter, that thing that I have, I have offering, which means that I cannot talk directly with my name. The only one I can talk with is this router. And then the other parameter will be so different. So in that case, when I have data for uh, alpha column column interface ID three, so this equipment, I cannot send it, so we share the same prefix, but I know that I cannot talk directly with it. So, I send it to the router. The router has a knowledge of MAC address and will send it to Alpha Clone Clone Interface ID screen. So every traffic will go to the router. Now the router may decide, but it depends on implementation, for example. But now, of course, you don't have broadcast facility, so of course you cannot send a neighbor solicitation, etc. because we didn't get broadcast, so that's why I was centralizing everything. But if you know the address, since we are an NPMA network, if you know the address, you can talk directly to that person. So in that case, and it's only the root of choice, it may send you a redirect message that says that if you want to talk with alpha column column interface ID3, then you have to use the MAC address of this machine. And after that, you will be able to send directly traffic. So the advantage here is that we don't use broadcast, and in some network, it's not possible to use broadcast. The only broadcast we use is at the beginning, but it's because we don't know the address of the router, so we use the broadcast address of the router. So when we will see uh, in RAN, wireless sensor network, and a protocol called fix open we will see that network discovery for wireless sensor network use a lot this kind of traffic with a router, and you don't have direct communication between devices. So, here uh, it's on the Cisco, and how I can configure network discovery parameter on the Cisco. So, when you configure an interface on Cisco, for example, here I'm configuring interface uh, VLAN uh, 5. So I can give an IP address to the interface, IP for address, so IP address, V address, and Cisco is very conservative because here you have to write an address. You cannot put a prefix. So here you have this, and then you have the configuration for IPv6. 
So first thing you have to do when you activate IPv6 is to put IPv6 on the board. If you configure the IPv6 address but you don't make IPv6 on the board, then you will not be able to send IPv6 to the You configure your IPv6 address on your interface. So here you give the prefix 2001-616-7301-1. So this is my slash 64. And I say here, use your MAC address to create your interface. Or I should have force here, for example, one, if I wanted to uh, to use a manually known. Manual known. So this is the IP address, and then I have to configure and say that this router has to send network discovery. So it's what we have here. So I say IPv6, neighbor discovery, and I say you have to announce this prefix. And here I have some parameters that are no more uh, very important. This one tells you how long you can use this, this address and how long this address will be preferred. So this is, I don't think it's in second. So it's uh, about days for so this. So the idea was the following. It's a very old concept of IPv6 that is not uh, very accurate right now. But for example, we can imagine that in the morning, it's better to use one provider. And in the afternoon, it's better to use another provider. Because the price is cheaper the morning for the first one and the afternoon for the second. So, what you can do is when you send a message, so you give the time you can use an address and how, how long this address is valid. And you give also a preferred time. And preferred time, say, when you open a connection, you can use this address. So here, for example, at this time, when I will open the connection, I will use this address. It means that after the time preferred has expired, I can continue to use it for my connection until the address become, becomes not valid. But when I will open a new connection, I will not be able to use this address. I will have to use another valid address. So you can this way do a transition. For example, you know that at noon you cannot use this uh, this address, this prefix alpha, and afternoon is better to use beta. So what you say is that valid will be until noon or until 11. And so it means that during this period of time you will use alpha. As default, and afternoon you can continue, for example, to use alpha for one hour, but new connection you, we will use beta. And this way you can move from one prefix to another. So this was the original dream of people that design IPv6 to be very flexible on prefixes. The fact is that right now we don't have this. In fact, industry is very conservative and doesn't want to change our prefix. We have seen yesterday that they prefer to have provider independent prefix and my company will have its prefix and it will be for the rest of the life. So, I don't want to remember every day or every hour my network. So, that's why it's not so important now to, to have these parameters. And then I have unlink parameters that say that I can use neighbor solicitation to talk with my neighbors and do a kind of ARP. If I have off-link parameter here, it means that all the traffic I have to go through the router. And then autoconfig means that the host can create this address from my prefix. It doesn't have to use DHCP to create it. And then, the last parameter is array interval. 
It means that your router will periodically send a message, a router advertisement message in broadcast to tell all the equipment, here are the parameters of the network. And so this uh, periodic array is very important. For example, if you want to move from one prefix to another, then you suppress the preferred time for one prefix, and you announce a new prefix. So since all the equipment will listen to their message, this way they can change their prefix. So now, if, we are, if I want so, here I have my, my configuration, but this configuration you see is uh, very basic. I just have an IPv6 address and a default router. And so I need other parameters. And for example, if I need some this DNS resolver, I can use, like in IPv4, DHCP messages. A DHCP message here will send a broadcast request on my link and I will have an equipment that will relay this message to the real DHCP server. So the real DHCP server can be either located using a multicast address and you see that the multicast address here is FF05 so the scope of this address is my company network, and I can find a DHCP server here, and, or I can also put directly the IPv6 address of the server. So the server receives information, reply to the relay, and the relay sends me the parameter. And this way I can get the DNS. So, and here I am fully configured to go on the internet and surf using uh, normal internet. So it means that for you, you arrive on the network and you have absolutely no configuration. And no real DHCP server. We have, in fact, DHCP can be split in two parts. You have these dynamic parameters, like the address, and you have static parameters that never change for any carrier. It's a DNS server, a DHCP server, etc. So, the problem is that when you propose or you present uh, Nepal uh, discoveries to some people, they say that it's not very secure. So, in fact, yes, we have some uh, security uh, problem, but we have also some advantage in IPv6. In IPv4, I know a company prefix, Let's say this company prefix is slash 24. So here I have only 255 possible addresses. So since I have 255 possible addresses, I will be, it will be very easy to scan all the addresses to see if there is a company. In theory, IPv6, it's a little bit more complex. Because I have a prefix with a slash 48, uh, 64. So I need that I have here 2 power 64 possible values. So to scan 2 power 64 value, it will, will take you more time than uh, only 250. But it's not so true. Because suppose that my I know that my company is using Dell computers. So if my company is using Dell computers, I know the first three bytes. It's Dell Vandox code. Then I know two bytes here is FF FE. So I have only three bytes that are remaining, and I have to guess. So how can I guess this one? <coughs> if I know the IPv6 address of one computer, I may take the idea that you're going to buy a lot of computers at the same period of time. 
So the serial number will not be sequential, but will be very, very close to one from another. So I can take one reference and try to scan, increasing and decreasing the, uh, the value. And maybe I will discover over again. So you see that? When I'm using, using something based on the MAC address, we don't have 2 power 64, but we reduce a lot the space where we have to look for addresses. So that's why using a random number, as Microsoft did, does, is better. Because random numbers are randomly spread around the, in the 2 power 64 values. So scanning will have to be totally stupid and do plus one, plus one, plus one, plus one to detect a device. So in that case, Microsoft is better than Apple to uh, just use the for the for the address. There is another thing that uh, is better in IPv6 is that we can you cannot send a broadcast on the network and get an answer. When I want to discover nodes on the link, I have to be on that link. And this discovery cannot leave the link, that we saw yesterday. So I have a better security here. But I have, so I cannot discover from outside my link. But there is something that may ask you some philosophical questions. Because the true rule, and currently we don't have uh, a real rule for that, is that if I put, if I register my equipment as a DNS, so you can just query the DNS and get the answer. So I am doing plenty of things to hide myself, but I can put this information on a DNS and I can be discovered. So the question is, when you would, in IPv4, I think it's the case of uh, that. When I'm configuring IPv4, what do I do? I send a DHCP request. To a DHCP server. And um, one of the parameters of the DHCP server is the name of my uh, computer. Let's go back. And then my DHCP server will allocate me an address and is able to do with the DNS a dynamic update and say COBA as this address. Okay? And this way, my, my machine can be viewed from outside. Now, when I am with IPv6, can I do the same? The answer is yes, if I'm using DHCP. Because if I'm using DHCP, it's almost the same. But if I am using neighbor solicitation, oh, sorry, um, router solicitation, and the neighbor discovery, so what will happen? I will have my router. So I have a DHCP server here. I ask for the prefix. I got the prefix. And I create my IPv6 address. But it is not new by name. Not nor by the DHCP server, but nor by the DNS. So maybe I can then register my address on the DNS directly. But here it's not secure. It's not secure because I have, for example, I can register the address of my neighbor. And when someone will talk to my neighbor, he will talk to me. So here it's not secure. Here it was secure because it was only this equipment that belongs to the management part of my network, but was able to talk with the DNS. Here is not the same thing. So, 
the question is, do we have to put things on the LS? Because if you put things on the LS, you can be found no? outside, and here it's complex. So far is no answer. But normally when you have auto-configuration network, you will not store your IP address under the LS. So you will not have the identity. And here it's not the case because I am not connected to IPv6 network. But in REN, when I'm using IPv6, and I want to do SSH to a server, it takes more time in IPv6 because SSH try to resolve the DNS to find the name of the server, name of the machine. And since it doesn't find it, it goes and time out, and it takes more time. But that's a strange habit in IPv4. So maybe we, we have to change this thing. And it's, we have also to imagine new way to manage network here for large companies. And that's a big problem because here, for example, I don't know what address I have post. And we say, we talked about that yesterday. I have a virus on my company, or I, I would like to locate the computer. I know the prefix, so I know where it is, but I don't know which computer it is. And I don't know to whom it belongs. Because the address can be based on the MAC address, but can be also on a number. And the random, random number may change. So for me, the network administrator is very difficult to track this virus. So that's some reason yesterday you asked, uh, do we have to push IPv6 in the industry? And that's why I told you that yes or no. If you are really obliged because you are talking, uh, doing business with Asia, and next week we will have no more IPv4 address in Asia, so it means that IPv6 has to be deployed in Asia. So if you want to talk with them, there is no choice just to use IPv6. So in that case, yes, go to IPv6. But undo for, and continue to use the architecture deployed for IPv4. But that's not the best solution, because it's still very heavy to use this kind of thing. If you don't care about IPv6 inside your company, just put IPv6 outside your company, as a boundary between your intranet and the rest of the world. So this way you will be able to talk IPv6 and inside your company you will continue to manage the network as you do in IPv4. Because you know you have more tools currently to do. But of course in three or two or three years we will not have the same point of view. Because you will find in new products new features to manage IPv6. You will be able to use them and it will be easier to manage. But currently, it's still complex to manage. So, if you continue to, to network discovery, there is a lot of attacks that look obvious when you look at network discovery. In fact, it's not really hard. You find the same problem in IPv4. But in IPv4, you don't have auto configuration, so it's not, it doesn't appear as it appeared in IPv6. So if you want to, to attack some IPv6 networks, so you have some uh, kit that you can download on the computer and do some uh, funny things with it. Of course, it's just informational. I did uh, discourage you to, to use the, this kind of thing. So we have plenty of things uh, funny. So funny attack, for example, is not represented here, but uh, yes, it's represented here. I send a question, so I want to enter the. And I send a question, who has. And a funny guy answer me. So I will not enter into the network because someone else has answered it. So if I draw a random number, I will draw a number, random number, and I will ask the question, and this funny guy said me. 
And of course, you uh, will never enter into the network. So that's not, it's a problem, of course. You, you can uh, play with that in an internet network, but uh, students will not be able to connect to IPv6, so you will have a lot of fun with that. But it's a type that must be done inside your site. It doesn't come from outside. So it's easy to detect. After that, that one computer is doing that. You look at the MAC address and you try to, to find the student. You have another uh, thing, it's, and it's more common, a more common mistake you have with photo configuration, is that you have a router here, and this router is not well configured. And it's easy to, to create this kind of thing. For example, you go to Riondo and your uh, for Amazon, for practicals, and uh, BP asks you to bring your laptop to uh, to use them to use it as a router in the platform. So you configure the laptop as router, and you make your practical. It works well, and you leave your door and you arrive here in Santa Teresa, and you forget that your laptop was a router, but was sending router solicitation. So your friends will get a wrong IPv6 prefix. And of course, it will not work because with this wrong prefix, you will send, so you are in Santa Teresa, you will send your request to the IPv6 internet, and the answer will go to Riondo. And so, uh, that's a problem. And here you, you don't make a mistake. In IPv4, I did the same. On my, uh, when I had the Windows system, I start a DHCP server on my uh, laptop. When I come back to my school, I become the DHCP server for the school. And I was giving a wrong, uh, wrong addresses, wrong user information, and of course I break most of the computer and connection. So you, you, you have the same problem in IPv4 and IPv6. But in IPv4 it's more visible because it's based on the configuration. And so here you have a router, and this router will send wrong advertisement, and so you, you cannot connect. So, how you can solve that? There is different way to, to do it. One way is very experimental and I don't think is really deployed on commercial solutions. It's something that is called SEND for secure neighbor discovery. And the idea of SEND is to use certificate to authenticate routers. We are going to to see how it works. But the problem with SEND is that you have to configure certificates. So we have a lot of configuration mechanism, but you have to configure certificate for your network. So in that case, it's better to give an IP address and don't use uh, auto configuration. So it can be uh, very complex. So the idea of SEND I will not uh, go into details. Well, for example, you have your device that contains a root certificate, for example, for ETA. And you have a router that has a certificate for Santa Teresa .ETA. So a certificate that derives from this one. So, the advantage of certificate, certificate is that you can send it freely because they are signed and nobody can change the content if they don't know the private. And you never send the, the private. So, here, when you do send, first, this router will have an interface ID which is an H 
of the certificate. Okay? And so this router has a root certificate, it doesn't know, so it, it is called this host is configured as a certificate to be auto configured at this time. So if you move to Yondo or Santa Teresa, you can configure yourself. So here, first it will request the certificate for <coughs> Santa Teresa that it has. It will get the certificate, certificate. Since it has the root certificate, it can verify that it's correct. And then, when it will receive a router solicitation from this equipment, since it knows the certificate, he can do the hash function and he will know that the interface ID is correct and it's come from the right router. And then you will have also a signature into your routing message that will come for the certificate and that proves you that you have the certificate, the product. So that's a possibility. But of course, if you do that, and I move by means take a real dose router here, then for him it will be correct. Because real dose certificate is derived from ETA. And he will accept it also. So normally, to avoid this kind of things, I will have to put here a Santa Teresa certificate. But if I do that, when I move to Riondo, I have to change my certificate to Riondo and remove Santa Teresa. Otherwise, if the router is less badly configured Santa Teresa, in Riondo with a certificate for Santa Teresa, we will accept it. So it means that if you want this to be very secure, you have to uh, change your certificate each time you move, which is not very uh, easy to do. So that's why send is not really used. So I was thinking that send was maybe used by military people because they want uh, strict security. I talked with some uh, military people that manage the PV6 network and they tell me that in the production network they don't use this kind of because it's too complex to so, it means that in your company, you will never use this kind of solution based on cryptography. What you can do, and what's more interesting, is to do filtering. It means that normally, just routers can allow router advertisement. So, for example, I am at ETAM network. I have here my access point. And here I have my router. And here I have those student laptops. So, what can I do? Is to avoid. So, if a student sends a router advertisement, then my access point will discard it and will never send it to a variant. If I receive a, a router and that is not coming from the internet, then I can propagate it on the Wi-Fi network. Because I know that the official router is on this network. So this way, I am able to block wrong router at that point. Another solution, for example, if I am on a switch, I know the port where it's connected my router, so I will put a uh, filtering list that will say that this equipment is allowed uh, has the right to send router advertisement. And the other are not, uh, cannot send router advertisement, and they will be blocked by the switch. So it means that in that case, you switch must be filtering, the, uh, must have access list to filter layer 2 packets, or layer 2 
which is not always the case. But that, that's why I told you that for production, big companies not ready. But this kind of things already exist on some element. And when IPv6 will become more and more popular, you will have this kind of things. So just an example, I don't have it here, that's fun because on the other side I have it. But I ATF uh, in Santa Teresa and uh, some in Anaheim, in Los Angeles, there was, a, I look at the interface of my computer, and I got at least five IPv6 addresses. Well, only one was correct, and the other one was sent by equipment that shouldn't have sent me router addresses. It was not a problem because, this, in fact, these addresses were not global ones. So, my system ignore these addresses, but if they were global, then my system should have taken them into account, and then I should have them. And next uh, next week, during the Prague meeting at IETF, I look again to my interface during the meeting, and here there was no wrong address. So my hypothesis is that they were filtering. Router advertisement to find the Wi Fi network. So, this way you've got just the right answer. So, if something that comes now, and so you will not have the problem in uh, coming years about this kind of thing. Another thing that you, you can do is to have a demand, and you run the demand on your network, and you look at router advertisement. And you, de you decide if this router advertisement is legal or not. And if it's not legal, then you send a mail to the network administrator and say, hey, there is a problem with this computer. <coughs> so this is another solution, and here you have a program that can uh, do this. So, uh, DHCP. We have already seen DHCP for. Uh, getting some parameters, static parameters like DNS, but you can use also DHCP to uh, get addresses. So it's the case we, we saw before. So there is no lot of difference. But I have here a message. So you send a solicit message. It goes through a relay, and the relay will forward it to your server. Your server, all your server in your company will be tried, and you select one server, and we, you, you talk. So I will not say bad things about Mac. Uh, so, and then when, of course, they give you the address for a period of time, and then you have to renew uh, it periodically, and when you want to suppress it, then you send a release. So it's almost the same thing as for IPv4. So, as I said, if you are a large company, you want to manage to put IPv6, which is uh, not very popular, you may use this kind of thing to centralize the address allocation. But for the rest of person in your home, in your school here, maybe your configuration is better. Now, there is a case where DHCP is good for parameters, dynamic parameters, and is not to give addresses, but to give prefixes. So for example, if we look at what will be the future, with ADSL. So in ADSL currently you have some, for example, ATM framing. And in an over ATM you can send a thread. So what do you do? You have here your ADSL ADSL modem or box router, let's say, that goes talking with a DSLAM in 
neural network provider. So, here, what do you do? You set up a PPP point to point protocol between the two equipment, and normally in IPv4, you negotiate your IP address, so it's assigned by your provider, and you learn some parameters like DHCP, DHCP, maybe DNS server, etc. etc. So you can learn a lot of So, since you have a PPP connection, PPP is layer 2, you can also establish an IPv6, uh, you can carry also IPv6 on your PPP connection. But here, in fact, you will just negotiate link local address with PPP. And that's all. There is no other parameters that are carried in PPP. All the other parameters are carried with other protocols. So, for example, if you want global addresses, then you can use either DHCP or uh, neighbor discovery to get the address. So, for example, here I send a router solicitation, and here I got the prefix, and I create my global address. So, my router here, in IPv4, will do not. And here I will have a DHCP server that will give private address for inside my network. And in IPv6, my router will be a real router. It will forward packets from one side to another. But of course, I need to know which prefix I will give inside the home. And so that, you have the HCP. So we've got an example here. So here, you send a request to your provider. So a DHCP request. And here, the answer will be a prefix. And this prefix is, for example, a slash 60. So you will have four bits to number your interface. And here, in this simple model, you will have only one interface, so you select, for example, alpha, column 1, column, column, slash 64 for this network. And then here, all the host will be able to configure using neighbor discovery. So you see the, the way you manage the network in IPv6 is a little bit different because here in IPv4 we give only one address, then we have the net process and we allocate private addresses. In IPv6 we delegate a prefix to the router and then we use a prefix to do the network discovery. And host will be configured. So in IPv6, it means that you will have end-to-end. -end. You are joinable from outside. In IPv4, you can go outside without any problem due to the NAT, but it's more difficult to be joined from outside. Yesterday we saw that, for example, you have to put uh, NAT traversal parameters, for example, to access your web server. In IPv6, you can access directly to the web server. Well, that's the difference in, in the architecture. So this thing will, is now deployed in some, by some provider to allocate IPv6. Okay, and so, I already uh, talked a little bit about that. Maybe you can give your opinion. So you are managing uh, an IPv6 network in your company. Uh, or your boss asks you to put IPv6 in your company, so what will you present? So if you want to keep track of addresses, you have only that. Currently, yeah, there is no choice. We at Telecom Button, uh, we are working on some architecture 
but it means that it implies that we have to say change the switch. Oh yes, another important thing I forget to, to tell you is that when you are running a network in your for your company, there is a protocol that is almost uh, necessary. In IPv4, maybe we forget, we don't use that much, but in IPv6, it, since we have auto configuration, it's important to have it. It's 802.1x. You know what it is? No? So, the idea of 802.1x is that when you see a RG45 plug, you can plug your computer on it, but you will never, you don't have direct access to the company network. So when you plug it, you, you have to authenticate yourself before getting connection to the company network. So it means that here, the the switch will send you a challenge. So it's a random number. You have a secret. Because you have an ID and a secret. And you will sign the challenge with your secret and the challenge you have. And you send back the challenge the response and your ID. You see that that way the secret is not sent on the link. It's just a challenge and the challenge is changing each time you read the processes. Then the switch will send it to a notification server, like a radio server, that knows also your ID and your secret. And so it it will do the same processing and will compare its response to your response. If it's the same, it means that they should share the same secret, so you are the one you pretend to be. And so here, you will make, will set OK and maybe some parameters, like the VLAN you want to connect, etc. etc. And then you are connected to your company network. So, for example, in these parameters, we can say this guy is not allowed to send router data. Okay? So, this way you can block and you can send through. But it means that your switch has to be a little bit clearer. So, what is important to notice here is that on my switch, I have a port. And now I have associated to that port an ID. So I know that it's you, but I'm connected to you. At ITF, you have another group. So this is a protocol here, it's layer 2 protocol called 802.1x. And if you are afraid about people that can put some uh, uh, a router on your network, to send router advertisement, then you can protect yourself by doing that. Because you have to authenticate yourself before getting connected. So now if you look at all your system, even Windows 7, you will have this, this kind of possibility to, to do 802.1x. So, the other thing is now, when I configure my IPv6 interface with a random number, for example, I will send a DAD. And the DAD will contain my IPv6 address. So what can I do here is to register the DAD and associate to that port IPv6 address that I have seen on the DAD. So this way I can establish a mapping between the identity and the address. So the second phase now is to send that to a central authority and you can have a trust between ID and uh, identity. 
So what is very important to notice here is that in your area, in your uh, network, you have a your network manager that can make the link between ID and IPv6 address. But when you live outside, then you are anonymous because your IP address is a random number. So you have places where you don't have a, a notification and places where you have so, or you are doing. So it's not uh, something that is true for end to end, but in some places you can have this information. So we can imagine, and that's things we, we try to do at uh, Telecom Bretagne. Is for example, you have the Santa Teresa uh, campus here. You go to Riondo, then you can exchange this mapping. So if you are going to Riondo, you will be authenticated here because we have given this mapping. But if you go somewhere else, you will not be authenticated. That means that you're, it's not global. It will be a third part of the so, but this is science fiction. We play with that at Telecom Bretagne. You have other groups that do other things with, for uh, example, Savvy Protocol, but uh, it's not implemented in products. Currently, I think there is two Cisco routers on Earth that can register the IP address on the port. So it's very experimental. But in the future, it may come in products to carry, to help you to manage IPv6 So, if we look at, so if we have this kind of thing, it will be easier to manage, and we don't need a central equipment like DHCP server. Because if we look at uh, DHCP, DHCP is a tool that has been invented to, to guarantee but we can use a very low number of addresses. For example, in this room, we are uh, currently 1, 2, 3, 4, 5, 6, 7, 8, 9, there is 10 computers. So, we have a prefix, let's say 148205, I don't know the another, another value, let's say 189, and so, the network and manager say, okay, I, I give a slash 24 for Wi-Fi network. So it means that I can have up to 255 students connected to that network. But the number of students that are at ETA, I think, is higher than 255. So um, if you look for a long period of time, you have millions of persons that, hundreds of persons that use this network. But you have only 200 addresses. So DHCP is a way to manage this. Now if you look at IPv6, if you are a client, if you are a client, you will receive a slash 64, and so you have 2 power of 64 possible address value. And at the time, you never have this number of students that will use a network. So here is the opposite. You have in IPv6 more address than persons. So you don't need this mechanism. And the other reason is when you have a server, you don't use DHCP for the server, because for a server, you will fix your address, regarding of the type of service you are offering on the server. So here it's a manual configuration on the server. So in theory, DHCP v6 is not useful to allocate address. In practice, it's different. It's also a psychological factor. It means that I told you that network uh, engineer we are very lazy, but they are also very conservative. And if they do something in IPv4, they want to have the same functionality in IPv6, even if they will not use it. So, 
we are, you have to, they have to, because if it's totally new, they will be afraid, and they will not be. So you have also to offer these, uh, this kind of things. But as I said, it's not purely psychological, because, for example, you, if you want to control who has this address, currently, it's the only way to do that, it's to you, to assign the address to the computer, and not let the computer use its own address. So that's, uh, that's the reason. So, to say in few words, if you are in a plug and play environment, so this Wi-Fi network, or your home, then you can use status. If you are in a big company, so you use that. Okay, so I think we are going to, to stop here, because now it's the second part of the, the lecture, and we will talk about routing protocols. So we will see that this afternoon, but inside this part we will also see how we can use IPv6 and some transition mechanism to move from IPv4 to IPv6. Okay? So now, is that doing? No, we have one hour. Okay, so we can go to uh, we can go to routine and go back to IPv4. And here I have a router. So you see this green box, no, uh, red box with different interfaces, four different interfaces, and I have configured, and that's mandatory, I have to configure an IP address on each port, on each interface. So it's not clear here, but here I have configured an Ethernet 1, beta 1, an Ethernet 0, alpha 1, an Ethernet 3, delta 1, etc. etc. So, when I give an address to an interface, I give, of course, 32 bit in IPv4 with a 128 bit in IPv6, but I give also the prefix length as an address or as a prefix length. So, from this, if I give you alpha.1 slash 24, then I know that the prefix will be alpha.0, alpha, slash 24. So the 24 bits, first four bits, will be in common for all the equipment. So I can create that way my routing table. So here I have a manual configuration of the network that are directly connected to my router. So that's a big difference, for example, with switches. Because with switches, you don't configure anything. When you buy a router, it's the minimal configuration you have to give is to set up the interface. Okay? So, now, if we look to a more complex network, like this one, I can configure manually routes. For example, I want to reach network prefix epsilon. So I will put in my routing table, so I will configure my router and say to reach epsilon, I can send it to the IP address and I will give a next stop IP address, it means an IP address I can reach directly from one interface. So here I will say alpha. So if I do that, it's not enough, because you see here my router has it's local configuration, I can reach alpha and beta and epsilon, sorry. But if I have a host on beta here, it can send the packet to epsilon, but epsilon cannot answer. So that's something important when you are doing routing in the internet, is that the routes are not symmetric. It's not because you created a path in one way that you have a reverse path configured. Okay? So, you have also to manually add 
the prefix done on router and one. So if you want to go to internet, so we have a router that will lead to over route on the internet and here, I may add another entry, and I say that here 0, .0, 0, 0 slash 0, so it's here default route. I have to send it to GABA2, and when I am at R2, I say that I'm sending to the next stop, it's named alpha w. Okay? So, this is a simple configuration, and in that case, you can do that, there is no problem. But, sometimes, you can make mistakes. But for example, here we don't have the case, but suppose that I have this, I am in Santa Teresa, I have a prefix in Santa Teresa, so and here I have a link with Rirondo, and I have another prefix in Rirondo, both my link as a server. So here, what do I do? Alpha dot one, gamma dot one, gamma dot two, alpha dot one, beta dot one. Okay, so I give address to each interface, and my router will create a static configuration. I say, if I want to reach beta, I will use Ethernet. If I want to reach gamma, I will use my point-to-point -point connection. Here, same thing. If I want to reach alpha, I will use Ethernet. If I want to reach gamma, I will use my point-to-point -point connection. And now, of course, here I cannot join beta from here. And I cannot join alpha from here. So I can pull the configuration that say, for other things, send it to gamma.1. And here I say, for other things, send it to gamma.2. So this way, if I send to beta, is not defined here, so I have to send to gamma dot 2, I find beta, and I send it to the other network. Okay? So, what do you think of this configuration? Okay, suppose that a secretary made a mistake typing a new URL or IP address, and send something to a prefix epsilon. What will happen? So alpha dot three, let's say to epsilon. So I go to the routing table and say that you have to send it to the router. And here you have to send it to the router. And here you have to send it to the router. And here you have to send it to the router. It's the right step. So will it last forever? Yes? Oh, yes, good. Not time to read, but I think it. You are IPv6 guy. So, we have a limit here, and we decrement a limit by one each time we cross a router. So, if, for example, I, a limit was set to 255, then my packet will do that 254 times. So, here it's a manual configuration, and you see that. When you are doing manual configuration, maybe you can create this kind of mistakes. Because the guy I really don't know say, okay, what is not for me is for the other campus, and the other one has the same uh, approach. So, now suppose that we have this. What happens with manual configuration? Can I join it here? So can I join Epsilon here? I am in Gamma, for example, I want to send a packet to Epsilon. What is my configuration here? Is when you want to reach, you want to send to Epsilon, you have to send it to Alpha.2. But Alpha.2 is dead. So I will never be able to reach this equipment. 
pay the payment. But here, I have an alternative route. But to have this alternative route, I have to reconfigure L1 router. So if, you have, if, it's in, if it's in the middle of the night, you have to wake up your network manager to connect to the router and change the configuration. And I told you, the network manager likes to sleep at night, so we would like to have something that works automatically. So that's why configuring manually a route is only good if you have this situation because you don't have any alternative way. So you don't have to reconfigure. And, but, when you configure manually, you have human in the middle, and maybe you can have mistakes. Misconfiguration that can create it. So that's why it's better to use routing protocol to configure equipment. Because it can adapt to the network, and the configuration will be much simpler because you just start the routing protocol and the router does the business for you. So that's the interest. So, we are going to, to see routing protocol, but a very global definition of routing protocol is to say that when you have a routing protocol, first thing you have to do is to configure all the interfaces on which you are connected. So that's a local configuration. And then the routing protocol will allow you to exchange this local configuration with other routers. And the, router, the routing protocol will look at this configuration and will add new route in your uh, routing table. So first, it's the last time I will use routing table. Routing table is too ambiguous, so I prefer SID for what information is. So, we will see that there is a less ambiguity on this for forwarding information today. So, the goal is to create this FIB, and we have two uh, routing protocol, uh, routing table, and we have two families of routing protocol that we are going to see. One is what we call a family of IGP for interior gateway protocols, and IGP are the friend of the network administrator. It means that they do the work, they do the work for the network administrator. So it's very easy to start an IGP, even if the IGP protocol by itself is very, maybe very complex. You start the running protocol and the router will discover his neighbors and talk to his, his neighbor to exchange the information. So it's totally automatic, and so you have nothing to do. So, that's good, but if you make a mistake in your configuration, the initial configuration, then this mistake may be propagated everywhere on your company network. That's why we cannot use this worldwide. Worldwide, we have to, we have to use another family of protocol with only one protocol of this family, which is BGP. We already talked a little bit about BGP. And BGP is a way to exchange information between to provide it. And here the protocol by itself is very simple, but what is more complex to do is the configuration of PGP. So we will see that in, uh, in some uh, in the class, but here you have a lot of parameters to play to allow the route to go from one place onto another. And if you make a mistake in your configuration, then maybe you will have a very bad quality of service. But here, exterior gateway protocol are more difficult to configure, but if you make a mistake in your configuration, you will not break the global network. You may, for example, break the interconnection with over ISP, but you cannot break something above, with some few exceptions. 
with this pattern. So IGP is three protocol, RIP, a very simple protocol based on a very simple algorithm called distant vector, and OSPF and IS2IS, which are based on another protocol called link state. So this distance vector is very simple to implement. Link state is a very, very complex component. But from the user point of view, they are very simple to use. So, it's what I said just before. And why I don't like the name routing table? It's because if you look at a router, you have two parts. This morning, when I gave you the architecture of a network, a router, I told you that you have your network card, so that can forward very quickly information, and you have a supervision card that is here to configure things on your router. And so, here is the set. So here is more a vision about a Linux machine. But in a Linux machine, you have a user space and you have a kernel space. And applications are running on the user space. So it's almost the same in terms of architecture. So what happens? At the beginning, you put in your forwarding information base what you normally call a routing table, local parameters. So it means where you are connected. So router number one will say I'm connected to alpha and beta. Router number two will say I'm connected to gamma and delta. And router number three will say I'm connected to epsilon and xi. So this is at here it's just to forward. It means that when you receive a packet, so you look at the destination, you find, for example, beta prefix, and you know on which interface you can send to beta. So now what you, are, what you are going to do when you start a routing process? You are going to move to copy this information from the FIB, and you are going to put it in a novel database that will be in your routing protocol. That's why routing table is not clear, because routing table the name routing means more the orange part of the machine than the yellow part. That's why field is uh, less ambiguous. So here you copy this in what we can call a RIB, a routing information base, and then you exchange this information with other routers. So other routers, by exchanging this information, will know about all the other prefixes that you have on your network. And then they will copy, select the route, and copy this on the field. And when it's on the field, then you can forward packet to that destination. Okay? So, what is important to notice is that I'm sending, for example, prefix alpha from the left to the right, to allow packet to go to alpha, so to go from the right to the left. So routing protocol is going backward from the, uh, the other direction of the traffic. Okay? Or, in another vision, another vision if, if you send a routing information, it means that, uh, so a prefix to another router, it means that you know how to send the packet to other destination. So, you have this signaling layer when you, or management layer, when you send information that way, and this way you can configure FIB to have packet to go from its Okay? So, we are going to, to see a very, very simple algorithm. So, this, normally you should not use it now in the network because it's a too simple algorithm and you may have some trouble. So you cannot classify it in fact in a routing protocol uh, as a routing protocol but more as an auto-configuration protocol. Because it's for very, very small network. 
But this uh, algorithm based on distance vector is very important because when you will be in red, you will see another protocol called Ripple, ARPL, which is used in wireless sensor network and is based almost on the same principle as uh, this. So it's something that is still, you have still standardization at ITF on this kind of uh, routine. So, the idea is the following. So here you have the algorithm. So, what you do is that you broadcast your feed periodically on the network. So by broadcasting your feed on the network, you tell the other what you know about the network. And the other, of course, will look at what you have sent. And if they find something new, so a prefix they doesn't know, then they will put it in their field, their own field. And if they find something that is more efficient than what they have done, they have selected before, then they will change the route. So it means that we are going to add a cost to the prefix we are sending. So here we are going to see that example. So let's start here, I switch on my equipment, this interface is on router as we if an at zero is down. So my, my network is uh, running. And here in black, inside the router, I have the local configuration I am obliged to give to start my routing process. So now what do I do? I broadcast on each link my routing table. Okay. So what do I say here? I know a network that is called alpha and the cost is one. I know a network that is beta and the cost is one. I know a network which is called gamma and the cost is one. It's the right thing. So I broadcast this, but of course, other routers will listen to that. For example, here we have only one router, there are two, since there are three, as this interface door. So, what does R2? What do we have to is okay, alpha the cost is one, I don't care because I've already I can join directly alpha with a cost of zero. So I don't care about alpha. Beta is something new I didn't have in my table. So I take it. I add this prefix beta and as the next stop, I put the IP address of the router that sent me the information. So it was sent by R1, but on the E0 interface, so the IP address was alpha.1. So in the routing table, I put alpha.1. Same thing for gamma and same thing for delta. It's new prefixes, so I add them in my routing table. And now, R2 broadcast its own routing table, or its own field. So it says I know alpha with a cost of one, epsilon with a cost of one, beta, gamma, and delta with a cost of two. So R1 is very interested by epsilon because it doesn't know what the prefix is, and he sends it to alpha.2. And R3 listen also the traffic, and then he learns that there is a prefix called beta, gamma, and delta, and he has to send them to epsilon.1. Okay, because this interface is done, so the only way to go there is to go through R2 and Okay, so here, it's magic. Because I gave just a local configuration to my network, and routers start exchanging their local configuration, and I was able to complete my field, and now I can go from any point to any point without any error, because my protocol did it for me, and so there is no mistake. Okay? So now, suppose that I put Interface E0 from R3 up. 
So what will happen here? Alpha, all the routers will send periodically their reading table. So alpha will continue to send it, and I will receive information about prefix beta, gamma, and delta. And here, what do I see? Here I have a cost of 2, and here the unknown cost is 1. So what do I do here? It is to change my next stop, and now I say, to reach beta, gamma, and delta, I send it directly to alpha. I don't have to send it anymore. So I have a shortcut path to go to this process. So you see now I can adapt and I can reduce the cost when possible, when I have a new one. Okay, so here I show you the easiest part of the protocol. And it's something that is quite uh, common in uh, all computer science is that it is very easy to add information to a system it's much more difficult to remove information from the system because adding information means that you are the same things Now, for example, the cleaning lady removes the plug from the switch for the router so my router is down but of course, he didn't have time to say, to say I'm dying. So, you don't know what he's done. So, you have to discover it. So, how can, for example, if L3 interface is here become unavailable, how can this equipment detect it? Or, for example, here, I know that, um, I know I am using to reach Epsilon, the route that goes to alpha.2. How can, if, like we have seen before, this router got broken, how can I change my route to send it to alpha.2? So in fact, it's based on the fact that I am sending periodically my information. So for example, if I take uh, this distance vector, every, every 30 seconds, I will send my routing table. So here, every 30 seconds, R2 will say I have the route to epsilon. And if R2 collapses, or the link here fails, then router R1 will not receive any more information concerning R2. So it will remove this entry. And R3 is also periodically sending a reading table. So here, epsilon now will be learned and it will be sent to alpha dot 3. Okay, so there is not, no way to remove information, so no specific message, but periodically we send a message, and if we don't receive for a certain period of time this message, it's like you have to suppress it. From the routing table, from the table. So, since what we have in red, for example, we send the routing table every 30 seconds, and if you miss three times the information, then you have to remove it. So it means that it takes 90 uh, seconds to find the alternative path. So here you see it's worse than what we have seen at the beginning of a class with spanning tree. But, so it's not very good uh, performance. So we, we can say I remove it, or we can say I put the cost equal to infinity. So more of this. Okay, so of course, there is a lot of drawback to this kind of things, to send periodically the routing table. So my slide is quite old now, but I have 350,000 uh, entries in my core network. So if I was using RIP on my core internet network, I will have to send every 30 seconds the 300, uh, 350,000 votes to my, my network. 
And my neighbor, we have to process the 350,000 routes to find if there is not a chance a new route or better cost in this. So of course it doesn't scale. So you cannot do it when you have a lot of entries in your routing table. So it's not so good. And also there is another problem, and uh, is that you have bad when you remove information, you may misunderstand the network topology and take wrong decisions. So my favorite uh, analogy with RIP is when you have uh, people uh, that exchanging gossip on the street. So you learn something and you repeat it to everybody you, you met and you say, well, you know, this guy is grand. This gossip is very easy to spread in the city. But if it's wrong, it will be more difficult to remove it from the city. So with RIP, we have the same problem. To add things, it will be very easy and it will be very fast. But to remove things can lead to bad news. That's what we are going to see. And there is different way to to solve this problem. One first is to set infinity to a small value, 50. So this way it will be faster. We have also, when you learn something is bad, then you send to the other a message immediately that says it's wrong. It's not true. So with this route equal infinity. So this way you expect that the other router will remove this information very quickly from the table and not propagate it. And we have a split horizon, and we are going to see that in the example. So here, first, we are going where we have bad gossips. Here, you see this interface, gamma, so it's here, infinite zero and one, is down. So what happened? L1 detect that is epsilon interface epsilon zero is done. So normally what you should do is directly to poison the network. It means to send a message that say gamma cost is infinite. And this way the other will remove gamma from parent. But you know that you didn't get the time to do that. And just before, he receives a message from, uh, from R2 with his routing table. So here, he will put, he says, OK, to go to Gamma, I have a possibility is to send it to R2. And R2, because here I have an entry, R2, alpha of 1, so this one will say, OK, can reach Gamma. And so it will put a cost equal to 2. Then it will send a message and say the cost to gamma is 2. So this one will increase it and put it to 3. And then it will put it to 4, because with this one we announce it with a cost of 3. It will put it to 4 and to 5, etc. And we will increase the cost of the root. And of course, at a certain point of time, we will reach infinity. And this way, we will say that this was unavailable. But during that time, if I'm sending a packet to alpha, then this both equipment has a route to alpha. So this one say send it to alpha 2, and the other one say send it to alpha 1. And the packet will do a ping pong between the two, these two equipment. So it is not a, a good solution. It's not the only solution. So the other solution is a split reason. And here you have an example of the split reason where it's forbidden for me to announce on an interface the route that goes through this interface. So it means that here on epsilon zero, I cannot announce the route that goes on epsilon zero. So I cannot announce routes for alpha, beta, gamma, and delta. Because all these ones are going through infinite zero. 
The only rules I can announce is epsilon, because epsilon goes through uh, a infinite one. Um, on the other side, I cannot announce root epsilon here, but I can announce the other rules. So this way, what happens? I will R1 will never receive announcement for R2 or R3, but it's possible to reach alpha, uh, gamma, sorry, from these two routers because the split horizon blocks this information. So this one will continue to put it at infinity. Either we have poisoning reverse, and this one will put it to infinity, or we will not receive any announcement from R1, and so after 90 seconds, we'll put it also to infinity. And this way, we have a better conversion. But you see that it can be tricky. And it doesn't work all the time. For example, here, if I have another interface between R2 and R3, then I cannot announce gamma here, because the split horizon forbids me, but I can announce it to R3. So R3 can say, OK, I will reach gamma through R2. And then, since now the split horizon over R3 to send through R2, we can send it to here. And this way, L1 will learn the route and will send the traffic through S3. So that's a, a big problem for it. And this is the case because you don't have a global vision of your network. And that's a big problem of uh, our free, is that each router gives its vision of the, of the network, and not the real topology of the network. So each router adds, adds you a lot of information, and you just get a summary of information, and to take routing decisions that involve the whole topology, knowing not all the topology, can lead to problems. So that's why RIP is not a very good solution for this kind of network. So in wireless sensor network, RIP or distance vector will be used. But you have a lot of things that will avoid you to create loops. loops. First thing is that if you have, a, you have a router here, and you receive an announcement for a prefix, and the cost is 2. If you receive another announcement for a prefix with a cost equal to 1, then you can detach from this one and go to that new link. Because if you be, uh, if the value cost decreases, you cannot have loops. Because a loop, what it is, is something, for example, that goes that way, and a loop as a cost. Okay, for example, here I have to cross two routers. And it goes back to me. And so this is an artifact. And maybe I have a real path that is also twice the cost, but here are two, uh, the cost plus two, but this is a real path. But I cannot make the difference, because I don't have a total vision. So, in Ripple, when the cost decreases, it's sure that you don't have loop, because the loop introduces a cost, and here it reduces, so it cannot be a loop. And the other thing is, when the cost increases, then here I destroy all my network here, because, and I will reconstruct it, because Maybe there is a loop, and it's easier to reconstruct things on a new basis than to try to recover things because here I don't have the total vision of net. And creation, as I said, creation is easier than suppression. So we will see that this kind of thing in, in more detail when we will study wireless and some things. So, it's a uh, 
it's just good if you have a very small network. And for example, uh, yesterday we went on uh, our Cisco router and we saw that we learned some information with it. It's because we have a very simple uh, topology and it's a very simple way to learn things. But don't use it in your company if you need a routing protocol because it's not very efficient. And, but this is not uh, due to just to read, but routing protocol are also create some security lag. Here, I am, for example, in a uh, network, network, and I am connected to the Wi-Fi network, and I am sending or getting the exam you will get uh, from my server in red. And you, you are a student in the network. And of course, you would like to know the exam before the day of the exam to prepare it. So, what can you do? If I had bridges here, it will be impossible to change. If I have router, it's not so true because router react to message we send to them. So here, for example, just to avoid the exam, you put your laptop and you send the default route on the thing. So what will happen? This router say, okay, the default route from the internet costs three routers here and only one router here. So I'm going to select this router as a default router. And of course, you broke it. Then go. Because all the packets will arrive to this equipment. And this equipment is not able to forward the traffic. So here is what we call a black hole. You know what is a black hole in astronomy? Is something that adheres matter and the matter disappears. Here, we have almost the same thing. We have an equipment that adheres packets and packets disappear. Okay? And why we have a black hole? Because you are not the prefix and you are not able to route packets on the prefix you have announced. So here, you just avoid me to make the exam because I cannot connect to the but I will detect it very easily. So what you can do is to ask a friend to put another laptop here, and for example, you create a tunnel with your laptop, and then this equipment will send the packet on the internet. And that way, I will get my exam, so I will notice nothing because it will work well. There is a little bit more delay, but it's uh, not possible to detect, but you you can copy the traffic and get the exam. Of course, if you do that, you can have a good notation at the exam because uh, there is a lot of things to, to do to configure and not to be uh, detected by uh, network management. But that's the problem of routers because routers will react to message we send to them. So if you are a bad guy, you can change routing property in your company. So, first thing to do, one thing we can do, is for example to put a clear password on every routing packet. So I put foo on all my routing packet, and my router here will never believe a packet if foo is not inside. That's the solution, but it's not very secure because you can listen to the traffic and know that the, key, the password is full. And then generate your packet with full. So there is no security. But you cannot say, oh, I don't know, I was doing a mistake because I make a practical and I have to configure a router and then I come back to the production network and I forget to disable my router. I'm very sorry, I will never do again. And if you say yes, but use the password of the production network, then, of course, 
it will be more difficult to believe you. Uh, uh, so it will be a pro proof that you were hacking the system. But that's not the, the best solution. The best solution is to use cryptography to sign your message. So one solution, which is not uh, now recommended, but uh, I think I never saw an implementation of the other, is to use MD5 to, to sign the packet, and it's a little bit like what we have seen with uh, IQ Poly uh, into 2.1x. So it means that when you create your routing protocol, what do you do? You have your routing announcement here, and you add a secret. So the secret is only known by you, and by all the other routers. And you compute an MD5 checksum. And when you send packet on the internet, you send the content of the packet, not the secret, of course, and the checksum. And the receiver receives your packet and the checksum. It has also a secret, and he does the same computation. And compare the result to the secret you sent. That way, if the value is the same, we know two things. First thing is that the secret has the same in both parts. Second thing is that nobody changed anything in the announcement. For example, maybe you can take a packet and change the 1 to the 0, and this way you have a better process. Here it's not possible because the checksum is on the whole time. And so if you don't have the good checksum, then the other router will not believe on your announcement. And of course, this since the secret is not sent on the network, nobody can learn about it. Okay? So, that was for the read protocol. Now we are going to, to look at something much, much, much more complex than RIPs. And RIP is link state protocol. So, link state protocols are totally different from, uh, from RIP. And they use another way to, to work. First, we will not break the global knowledge of the network. One of the big problems of one big problem of RIP is that RIP, as I say, was taking information, make a summary of this information, and then all uh, uh, then all of the router didn't get a true vision of the network but just the summary of the router. So here we are going to avoid this, and we are going to try to build a topology of the network. So learn what is the map of the network. And from the network map, we will take our decision to root packet. So it will not be based on local vision, but on the global vision of the network. So, we are going to see how it works on uh, an example. So here, I have some routers. These routers are connected to links. So here I get the, the prefix here, alpha, beta, gamma, etc. So here I have the local configuration. So here, I manually have to manually assign the address, and from this address, the router will have is filled, but it will be filled with uh, connected interface. Okay? So, now what we are going to do is, we are going to do magic. Oh, sorry. Before magic, we are going to move in another space. So we forget about film. 
will free, it was very confusing because what you sell is your routing table. So it's not very easy to make the difference. Here we will have two different things. We will have a kind of distributed database that will store information, and this information will be extracted from the field. But it's not exactly the same information. So that's why it's better to call that field and this grip routing information base because you don't have the same information. For example, here, at the FIB level, I have the prefix on the interface, and here, I put a prefix on the cost. And the cost is, for example, the speed of the link, or the inverse of the speed of the link speed. So it means that when my link is slow, I will put one in red. When my link is high, or high speed, I will put 10. Okay? So here, it's purely local. You are very lucky here because you see a global vision of the network. But nobody saw that. Everybody sees only what he has in his memory. So here, the magic arrives because we can exchange all these database, and so all the routers will know all the local configuration of the routers. So here I just copy this information here, and I put that on this map. And all the equipment will have this 600. Exactly the same. So we will see how this magic can be done after, it's what we call flooding. But suppose that we have this information. So the first thing, thing you can prove is that if I just give you this information, you can draw back, you can draw the network approach. So try to do it. So I know, for example, that router, alpha, uh, router A is connected to prefix alpha, and I know that B, beta B is also connected, and C is also connected. Okay? So by taking this information, you can recreate the, the network map. So it's not uh, easy to imagine, but all this big growing can be uh, represented by a very, very few values. So, how we can have a look? So here, for example, I go from root, router A. So router A says I am connected to uh, beta. All right, let's say I'm connected to alpha and Beta. Okay? So what can I do next? It's for example to look to all of our equipment that are connected to the alpha. So here it says that uh, you have B and you have C. Okay? Now B, uh, so I go to beta. Beta is D. There is a open equipment to beta now. Uh, D is connected to eta and to ga, uh, D to gamma. Okay? So here it's on from gamma. And so D is connected to gamma. So, I have seen A and D. Now I can have a look on uh, B. So, B is connected to alpha, E is connected to gamma, and e is connected to delta. Okay? So, I can see who is connected to gamma. So, I have B. I have D, 
and that's all. Who is connected to delta? Delta is uh, B, but it's B here, and E, E, that's it. Then, nothing else to, uh, to gamma, to delta. So now I can look at E, E is connected to delta, and to C. It's a very good class to learn Greek. Uh, and then C is connected to F. And F is connected to Epsilon. And Epsilon is connected to C. Uh, C. So it's here. Okay, what do we have? Well, I think it's it's all. Uh, okay, so this is my vision of network. And now I can compare. So I can compare to that one. Oh no, because it was not in a good frame. I can compare to, to that one. So it's almost the same. Okay? B connected to D through gamma, uh, beta here, and from D I can go to beta. For example, here I have another loop composed of. Uh, we have delta, epsilon, c, and uh, so here I have epsilon, sorry, epsilon, c, and delta. Okay, you see here I have two loops, and I find again these two loops here. Of course, I try not to draw the same way, but with this two information, I have the network topology. Okay? So, what we are going to do this afternoon is now, but since I have this network topology, I have to find the best path to go from one point to another. And here I will use an algorithm which is called the shortest path first to find this best path. Okay? So, let's have a break. <laughs>